Hey everybody, welcome to the 100% Builders podcast by Jam.dev. Today we are joined on the show by Steve Ruiz, founder of TLDraw. Hello. TLDraw is a whiteboarding application and an engine for applications that render React components onto a Canvas interface. TLDraw makes two things, a very good multiplayer whiteboard and the open source library that powers it. Steve is a developer and an interaction designer currently working with creative tools. He's constantly building prototypes and is an esteemed artist. Only makes sense that he went on to build Tildra. He's a creative genius and we can't wait to talk to him more about his journey. So let's dive into it. You know, before we started recording the podcast, you were just telling us how you stumbled upon this journey. But before that, you were an art major, an art student. Is that right, Steve? Yeah, no, I, so I was originally living in Chicago. I'm, I'm living in London now. And uh, yeah, I studied art, my undergrad, painting and drawing, uh, did my master's at the University of Chicago. Um, again, I'm kind of painting and drawing. Um, it's a little different studying at the slightly higher level. Um, but yeah, that was my, I mean, that was my, my thing. I kind of painted, had a little studio. Uh, and I also wrote a lot about art and interviewed other artists and kind of participated in the um, little bit of like the scene such as it is in, in Chicago. Um, at one point, I guess by the very first thing that I ever built for anyone, um, before I knew how to book anything, what I was doing, et cetera, was like a, a website you could go to, to find out, uh, about all the art shows that were coming up in Chicago. Um, especially fun since a lot of those shows were being run by students, they were in basements or they were in like dorm rooms. They were like gallery shows being run out of people's like car trunks and stuff. Um. But it was, uh, yeah, it's like a running archive now of like, you know, tens of thousands of these sort of like ad hoc uh, exhibitions and spaces. And so I made that and I ran that for a little while. But uh, yeah, primarily just a, you know, dirty hand painter boots with enamel on them, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that was my background. And somehow from there, you went on to build the JavaScript engine that powers most collaborative whiteboarding apps on the internet, which is such a deeply Almost, yeah. technical understand, like understanding of the browser and rendering. So clearly there are some steps in between. Can you walk us through the journey? Yeah. So uh, I, I did have a little bit of technical skill, literally like WordPress websites, you know, I didn't know how to program JavaScript, et cetera, uh, until maybe 2017, so not too long ago in terms of, uh, you know, I'm like 36 or 20. Steve, can I, can I interrupt for a second? I think people who are listening are going to be really inspired by this. So this started five years ago. Before that, you were painting and designing. That was your yeah. thing. And then you go into this super hardcore technical journey. Well, it took me a while to get there because I... I, I kind of started in, in design um, as like something that was adjacent. I, I turned 30, I shut down the studio. I'm like, all right, I previously had done some kind of analytical day jobs and then some creative, you know, me time. I was like, all right, let's bring those together. Let's, let's see what I can do um, without keeping those things separate. Uh, and I got into design, but I also kind of really quickly got into like prototyping, interaction design, um, and decided to spend some time building up those skills. I was using a product called Framer, which way back then was, it still exists. It's great. They're doing well. It's like a kind of a, a website builder app, but when it started, it was a strange little programming app for designers. Uh, and that really clicked with me. Um, and I, that was my entry into programming. I was like the designer who codes when that was cool in like 2018, um, and helped a lot of folks, you know, essentially I started my career helping design teams prototype, uh, as part of the design process rather than like mocking up and kicking it over and then having to go back and forth a whole bunch of times. I, I would just build something in an afternoon that would give enough learning or it was testable, um, and, and help the design and engineering out that way. I was kind of in the middle. Uh, I ended up actually working for Framer out, um, while I was here, they're in Amsterdam. Um, and while I was there, I was doing educational content. So a lot of you know, bought a fancy mic and uh, made some tutorial videos and uh, 
uh, had to teach um, this kind of technical content to other designers, which helped me become a lot better at, at it um, and kind of developed my default kind of the normal suite of skills that you might have as a front-end developer, full stack E a little bit, uh, and then continued after Framer again in, inside of like kind of creative tools as a, uh, as a niche. And that was right around when the pandemic was happening. I had a little bit of extra time. I also had a two-year-old, so you know, not that much extra time. And uh, <laughs> I started getting more into open source and the open source uh, problems that I was attracted to were these like, what you could call them like visual problems that were also impossible to solve because they were just highly subjective. So I made a, a library called um, Perfect Arrows, which, you know, so that, okay, if you have a box here and a box here, we're going to draw an arrow between them, uh, but that arrow is going to be perfect. Uh, it's not going to be straight arrow. It's going to be curved, but we're going to decide the curve based on the proximity of the things and how much they overlap and the, the relative dimensions of the thing. And uh, it, it was an impossible project. It was an impossible problem, uh, but the project turned out really great and people used it. I used it. It was it's super fun. And uh, I also built it that library very much like on Twitter, like because of these arrows were just so fun to watch, like kind of swindled, like, do all that. Um, and so I was just sharing GIFs of the, the arrows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and built up a little bit of an audience of people who like arrows, of which there are many. And, um, and then I moved on from arrows to, uh, ink, freehand ink. Like if you've ever used an iPad, maybe like procreate or something, you have a pencil, um, and it. It simulates like the, the, a line that kind of looks like it would, if it was a real pen, um, or a real marker. And that's normally it's based on the pressure, like how hard you're pushing makes the, the line get bigger. And if you're not pushing very hard, the line gets smaller, thinner. Um, and there's ways to simulate that. There's also ways to get that data in the browser and like build that line yourself. But, uh. It was a really, really hard problem that no one had really tried to solve, uh, or at least the one solution that was out there wasn't uh, good enough for me to feel, anyway, I had an idea. I thought I could make it better. Uh, and again, I kind of built this in me. Like just to jump in for a second, like, sure. but why, like as you were building <laughs> these things and content, like why, why did it resonate with you? Uh, well, I think it resonated with me primarily because these were like visual problems, uh, and I had spent, you know, it spent my 10,000 hours staring at paint, you know, and, and ink and <laughs> laying down lines. Uh, so I, I guess I, um, you know, if anyone was going to do it, it would have been me. Um, but yeah, the, there was a, there were a couple of like projects that I was working on, but. I wanted to use this type of thing. Like I, uh, one was called a uh, Telestrator. I don't know if you're familiar with that term. I'm sure you've seen it like on a, like a football game or something on TV where they are drawing on top of the video. Yes. They're like, yes, this 100%. guy over here is going to run over here and it's going to get yep. tackled. Um, there's a name for that technology. It was invented in the sixties. It's called Telestrator. Uh, you know, like a Telestrator and there are. Um, the software that lets you do that. Uh, I didn't want to buy expensive software for, that was designed more for, um, broadcasting, but I did want to be able to draw on top of my screen during video calls like, like this one. Um, and so I had, uh, I had, <laughs> yeah, the other stories within stories here. Um, I had created, uh, like a drawing application, like as a demo while before, um, I knew how to make, you know, an electron app, electron app is can desktop app that can sit on top of your screen. So you could have it like be fixed, like to front, uh, and you can also make it transparent and allow events to pass through it. So it's kind of like, it's not there, um, unless maybe you hit a keyboard shortcut or something like that. And then now it is there and now you can draw on top of the screen. So, uh, that, that it does exist. It's on GitHub somewhere. It's Telestrainer. Um, but when I was doing that, I was using a stylus. I was using like a pen, you know, and I knew that the stylus were like reported pressure. 
Like I knew that that data was going to the browser. It's just, I didn't know how to use it. And so, um, that's kind of the origin story for that ink library that eventually became like perfect freehand. Uh, it was just like, yeah, I just want to, just want it to look like it does in Photoshop. I want it to thin and, and big and, uh, depending on the pressure and, uh, yeah, it took like six months of kind of side hacking <laughs> on this very, very narrowly defined problem. Um, but again, I was doing it in public. It was all on Twitter. It was incredibly fun, uh, incredibly addictive project to work on. Um, tons and tons of weird little edge cases yeah. like doing the little back and forth scribbles or, or corners or all sorts. Um, but it, it produced like a really popular, what is now like an incredibly popular, uh, open source project. It's used in Canva. It's used in ClickUp. It's used in, you know, note taking apps, Caladraw. We use it in Tealdraw. I just saw it's used in, uh, what is it? Uh, it's the new thing, the playground AI. So it's anytime you see digital ink on the web, increasingly it's going to be the stuff that I made. That's because it's Congratulations. good. Congratulations. <laughs> but yeah. Over the last five years, you learned to code spent countless hours like crafting details of these now fundamental open source libraries of the web that now are some of the most popular open source libraries in web development that power some of the most prolific and most used apps on the internet. It's like your whole life has changed over the last five years. I think a lot of people listening are like, I feel very inspired. I think a lot of people listening are like, yeah, wow, I could change my life in that direction too. It's now, when you talk to people who are thinking about going into open source, who are thinking about developing, a lot of people start projects, but six months of all the edge cases, what kept you going? What advice do you give to people who are thinking about going down that route? Yeah, I think just kind of, just kind of two main things. First is like picking the problem. Um, so I know you probably hear this more now in the context of like startup of like founder problem fit, you know, it's like, it's an interesting problem, but like, are you the this, do you really want to stay up late working on this or will you? Um, and yeah, for me that, you know, picking things that were, that were visual, that were, um, that I had a, a need for in terms of the things that I wanted to build, uh, mm -hmm. and where all that kind of like loosely defined experience that I had, um, uh, or even like taste, like I knew what a good lo line looked like, you know, which is hard to define. But, you know, I did. And uh, so that, that was, I, I would suggest the same thing. So I'll reach outside of tech to find, you know, what kind of problems would be interesting to you um, based on who you are. Uh, and then the other was that, like, I've always really insisted on building things in public, almost sometimes a little bit to a fault. Um, <laughs> and uh, the, but the, the, the thing that you get out of that is, people cheering you on, uh, people getting involved. I had a lot of more math minded, um, folks who jumped in or like, oh, yeah. you need to learn linear geometry. I'm going to teach you, you know, <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah. Uh, and, um, and just like a ton of social validation that like, you know, if what you're working on is interesting, um, and if you're working on interest, like interesting problems, then like people will notice that and, uh, will share it and just get involved. So this would be my, my things like pick a good problem and then don't, don't be afraid just to like make it a social project from the very beginning because, uh, that'll, that'll keep you engaged. Yeah. The thing about, uh, I think you gave sort of a peek behind the curtains there where you were talking about how you were building the project in public. And because of that, as you were sharing things, other people were chiming in and helping you out to understand things that you're not really familiar with back then, like, like the math related things. Um, yeah. Maybe if we go back a little bit, you were saying earlier how you had to build this educational content to teach other people. So you had to learn really quickly before you could teach others, which is a yeah. great way to teach people and like learn at the same time. Right. But where were you learning things from during that time? Ooh. Well, I, I mean, I was learning also a lot from open source, like I was just reading everyone else's you know, homework, essentially. <laughs> um, uh, and yeah, I think 
there were a couple of projects that I just followed, um, that, well, yeah. And then once I got kind of into the weeds of, uh, needing to learn, like you have a line and you have a point and what's the closest point on the line to the point that's not on the line, those types of things. I actually was in game development. Um, I've never developed games myself, but, but I have, um, read a ton of old PHBB video game message boards from like, you know, 2002, where people were asking these types of questions. Um, you know, how do I make a racetrack? You know, that's essentially the same question as how do I make a digital ink line, you know, sticker center it has corners it has information density. Um, so yeah, looking for like digging through, uh, old message boards, having to translate things from one language into that I didn't know into a language that I do know. Um, I sure wish that I had like chat GPT had come out like a year earlier or something like that. That would have helped me a lot. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, and then solving, solving some problems that I knew that had been solved elsewhere, um, just on my own time or in my own way of doing it. I, I know like I got really into state machines as like a, a way of managing super complex interaction state, like where like, okay, you're holding the shift key, but you're also drawing and you know, you're uh, but uh, you're, you're not in read only mode. It's just like this weird, complicated, like bundle of, uh, of facts, which add up to, you know, how should I respond when the mouse moves? Uh, and yeah, I, um, like I, I learned that whole thing by building something myself, like a solution for that or a technology, like a library for myself to use. Um, I don't use it anymore. Uh, other people do, but I, uh, <laughs> but his primary function was actually just teaching me. So it was like a kind of a a high effort way of learning uh, for myself. I'm curious to double click on building in public. There's a lot of talk about building in public. Um, when I look at your Twitter, it's so, there's such a positive community that you're engaging with, but my hunch is building public in the first week doesn't feel like that. And there's a sort of hurdle to get through. And so what is building public look like in the first month? And if you had to give like two pieces of advice to someone who wants to build on that route, what would you want? to impart to them in that first month so that they set themselves up for success. I mean, there, it, it's building that that's a little bit, um, of something just to get comfortable with. And uh, I think every time that I tweet out a, something in progress or share something that way, especially on topics that are like, again, kind of more mappy or more highly technical, um, it's a little bit of a, like an, an exercise in like. Um, bring it on, you know, so, <laughs> like, you know, court, court, that type of criticism or like, you know, I can do this a little bit of rebellions. Um, but I would say for someone who's just trying to build that, that muscle, um, for the start, um, I think engaging with other people who are building things that are either in a similar vein or who are at a similar, similar point in the progress of the product or just a similar point in your career or something with some overlap, uh, and getting into what they're building and asking like, I have highly specific questions oh, from a place of like, uh, genuine, uh, like honest, like don't waste anyone's time, but for example, like, uh, Jared Sumner. Uh, the guy just working on bun, bun oven. Um, like there've been a couple of times where I have engaged, uh, who, by the way, great Twitter type of build in public content. Um, there's a couple of times where I engaged with, with Jared, you know, on like, like really super obscure, like optimized. Okay. What have you know, better if I do an array this way, or how is the memory managed on there? Um, and, uh, that's a, that's a good way of building, it sounds weird, but that's a good way of building, uh, building community is just, um, digging really deep into something that someone else is working on while also building your own, um, and kind of inviting that, that as well. Definitely an open source, like you can, um, you can ride some sales, uh, or like hold on to some coattails or just by building with someone else's stuff. You know, that gives them an opportunity to 
engage with you uh, to say like, oh, actually, you know, you could be doing this better um, <laughs> or like using this in a more effective way uh, while also wanting to kind of promote your stuff um, because it has the same audience. And, you know, I mean, I retweet almost everyone who uh, is building with TealDraw just because it's, I love to see it. It's absolutely in my interest to have other people see that as well. Um, and yeah, and, and thereby kind of like, and gently putting coals in the build in public fire or whatever, um, encouraging everyone to, to do it a little bit. Mostly I just love, love the content. It's my timeline more interesting. It introduces <laughs> me to good people. So try and encourage it. I like this idea of like just being okay with like sharing stuff, but also piggybacking off of other people's like tools who you're actually using and maybe giving them a shout out or tagging them and they will sort of chime in with not only retweets and likes, but also maybe tell you like, hey, there's a better way to do this thing. And that way, like engaging with them. So that's a really cool way to do it. Don't overdo it, please. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because when, when, like, when I think about building in public, I think about the broadcasting aspect of it, of like, you know, just like publicizing what's on your desktop at any given moment. But actually what you're saying is very different. It's um, finding the people who are doing that too and engaging with them and just, and being public is actually just a small part of that. And I, I think it's an interesting shift. No, I think, I think all of these projects that I've worked on have just like a, just enough humor in them. Like of like, yeah, I'm going to build the perfect arrow or something <laughs> like in order to sort of allow, um, I don't know, allow me that the sort of ironic distance necessary in order to like promote it uh, endlessly. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I, I've also told people in the past, like to, uh, like if you do want to build in public, if you do want to build up your reputation that way, or you know, do the kind of organic marketing really that like um, it helps to pick problems that translate well into GIFs and videos. Huh. Um, that if you are working on some gnarly database stuff, uh, that's not necessarily going to like make for good TV. Um, so yeah, definitely, uh, it, yeah, pick something that you can show people, um, and then make it very, very easy to show people, uh, for yourself. So at this point in the story, you'd build a couple of really popular open source libraries that had sort of beautified the web, these perfect arrows perfect freehand um can you what's the story behind tl draw what was the day that you started thinking about it and what was the day that you said all right that's it i'm going to build this okay this is another sort of like one thing is going to lead to another uh while working on perfect freehand uh, someone suggested uh it was, it was actually the, the founder of the good notes uh, app uh, on, on ipad um we were chatting and uh He's like, yeah, we use, we use circles to do our ink circles, two circles connected by arcs circles. Huh. Uh, and I went super deep onto this, ended up finding like a white paper on Andrew Glasner on this thing called a glob. Um, globs are two circles with two busier curves that touch them at their tangents and it ends up looking like a teardrop or like a glob kind of weird, slightly dirty, uh, shape. And, um. I got super into this. I'm like, I'm sure that we can use this to create my ink. I just need a way of like learning about this shape and ended up building out an entire like, uh, app. I would like design tool based around globs where you could create glob. It's called globs.design. It's still up. Um, and you know, you could select your globs and move them around, do all the, like the normal Figma style, like design stuff, but it was <laughs> the only thing you had to work with was these shapes called globs. Um, and, uh, I, I ended up not using that direction. It was too hard to configure it out. Um, but I did adapt that same code base into a new app, uh, that you where I could do more than just globs. I could do points and lines and stuff like that. Again, kind of in, in pursuit of, uh, a little environment for myself to figure out some of these visual problems that I was working on, uh. But I was building it again in public and I was also building it in React. So it was like this graphics program, like design tool, um, but with a canvas that was 
built in in React and it was very easy for me to add new things to the canvas, right? Like if I wanted to add a new shape type, I could do that very easily. Um, because the, the rendering side of it was simple. It was like a React component, a little SVG thing. Uh, and then the, the system that I had for making it had been through a couple of iterations and it just sort of worked. Um, and then, uh, I had some folks who were like, this looks like a, kind of like a whiteboarding, like a, a Miro type thing. Um, I'm like, yeah. So I started building a little bit in, in that direction. And as I was sharing that stuff, it started getting really, really popular. And I started getting DMS of people being like, Hey, we're thinking about doing like a canvas type thing, but we, uh, we don't want to start from scratch. Can we build with what you're doing? Uh, and I was like, God, oh, you know, it's not open source yet, but we'll talk. And, uh, then that continued to happen. Eventually I was, uh, either gonna, some companies started noticing my work. I was either going to go work for Adobe or Figma. Um, and in the meantime, I was like, all right, I'll, I'm going to take some time off. I'll work on this open source project for a couple more months and then I'll go work for you know, one of these companies, uh, unless something good happens, in which case I'll work for myself. Uh, mm -hmm. I went full time on it. The very next day I got a sponsor, you know, saying like, can we build on this? I just want to do this right now. Uh, I basically was like, yeah, $75,000 and they said yes. So now it was funded for the rest of the year, uh, ended up That's picking amazing. A, uh, a bunch of other kind of individual sponsors who wanted to use the app, like teal.com, like as a, just as a user, basically rebuilt it again between like August and November, shipped it public at the end of November, everything open source, everything free, you know, a little bit of a hail Mary before I went Cape work for a large, uh, well, I guess it's all the same company now. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but it, it got hot. Like people started building with it. I think the first production, like thing with lots and lots of users shipped like within six weeks, which wow. to think about like building these canvas stuff, they, it's, 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 there's just so much to build. There's so many like table sticks features, all this stuff, the nightmare. Um, and the fact that people were able to like pick this up and run with it, um, What's your thing grab what loose? There's nothing else like that. Um, and so based on that, based on like the feedback that I got, it seemed like either I could go full time. I got another $120,000 of sponsorship. Like I was like, all right, this, there's definitely something here. Um, uh, I could either keep doing it solo, uh, and sort of support the people who were using it and kind of go push uh, sponsorships, uh, but uh, eventually I realized it was kind of like the, the opportunity was a little bit bigger than just me. Um, and folks really wanted, well, I don't know. I kind of had this like popular whiteboarding tool that people were using, like which, which was tildraw.com. And then I also had this like popular library that people were using and like wanting a lot on that side as well. So I ended up raising uh, close to 3 million in VC bucks and creating a company around it. And, uh, that's what I've been doing since is we started the building both of those stories forward. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, going, it's going pretty well. Steve, how long did it take for, you know, that first line of code for this library and getting it to like a company using it for their product where everyone's using it? That first big corporate sponsor was maybe like four months in, but again, it was like, I tend to roll things forward. So like the library used the globs engine, used the ink, used the arrows, used the, so, um, it was, it's hard to say it's, there haven't been many like clean starts. Um, but it was, you know, I, my own ambitions went from being like, I wanted 10,000 followers on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> to, I want to raise $3 million in under a year. Uh, so that was, uh, that was pretty quick. Um, and yeah, I did end up having to call it, basically cancel my, my start date for, um, for a normal job. So everything worked out well. That's, that's an incredible story. And you said something really interesting where you're going from one open source, you're building these multiple open source projects and you're sort of taking things that you have built in a previous open source project or you're something that you're building already and taking it that to the next thing. For someone who has not been in the software engineering industry for a while, 
Like, how did you learn how to architect things in a way where you can do that? Yeah, I think actually this, there's, there's a lot of like my, um, my approach to making stuff comes from what studio art. And like, that's the, the place where I learned to like how to do creative work or how to just, it's how to do whatever the hell you want. Um, the, which is a very intimidating, uh, <laughs> prompt is like total creative freedom. Doesn't matter. You're not going to sell it anyway. Just do, you know, <laughs> you know, spend your time and decide what you want to do. Uh, and to be able to make consistent work, um, you kind of start from a consistent constraints. Some of that might be like material, like, okay, these are going to be 10 paintings. I'm going to do 10 paintings. I'm going to be doing 10 paintings at this size. I'm going to do 10 paintings at this size with these materials of this subject, with these colors, you know, you kind of like constrain what it could be, which is anything into something that is going to feel cohesive at the end of it. Uh, and then once you have those constraints set, uh, you can basically do whatever you want because whatever you do is going to end up succeeding within the bounds that you've given it because you will have 10 paintings. They will all be the same size and they can't, they, uh, they might not be good, but they will be, <laughs> they will be like success. It will be a successful project. Um, and then, uh, yeah, also to be able to always, I don't know, like the way you make things be yours, this isn't going to come off very well, but the way that you build a kind of consistency is by making not not consistency, the way that you build an aesthetic or, um, uh, a kind of personal, like the way that Steve's paintings look like Steve's paintings is because they look like other Steve's paintings. Is that like, they are, um, you, you go deep, you go deeper into something, you don't you never really put anything aside and start over. You're just always adding another layer of complexity into the same problem. Um, and so maybe the next set of 10 paintings is a little bit bigger, but it's still borrowing some of the learnings, borrowing some of the constraints that you used before. Um, probably not your, your normal tech way of helping solving or whatever, because it's not really a problem that you're solving at first. It's just uh, more of a problem solution exploration space. Uh, I think the, the main takeaway from that is, uh, to work on tiny things that compose well together. Um, that if I had started by saying, I want to build Figma, uh, for the web, like, you know, with a react canvas, um, that would have been really hard to do. It is hard to do now I find myself in that position, uh, but building, you know, ink building small shapes, building, solving these little problems, thinking about state management or something like that. Um, those are things that I can roll forward. And so if I, I don't know, if the next project is let's build an AI canvas, you know, that's collaborative, like I will roll teal draw in, you know, as, as that, um, which will roll everything up. I hope that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, three interesting nuggets from there, starting with the first one, which is start with something small, like don't start thinking about, Hey, like I'm going to build Figma. So slowly start building that. The second really interesting thing is like this like, universal principle of compounding effects. You start with something small, but then like you said, go a little bit deeper. So you keep going deeper and deeper and gets more complex, more useful, more things happen, but it has this underlying signature that like this looks like Steve's painting or Steve's work. And the third uh, thing that I noticed was, and this is really unusual, like I think when we think about, oh, like painters or people who work in the studio, we think about chaos or like following impulses. There's that, but there's a lot of planning there. Like you oh, were yeah, thinking, yeah, when yeah. you're creating like a series, you're thinking about what are the constraints, how many things you're going to build. And you're building that approach to building software as well, which I found super interesting. I mean, the uh, different ways of saying this that I've, I've used, but yeah, you, you always want to be operating on a surface that is sort of like slanted towards where you want to go. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, because you could go in any direction. Eventually just, you will end up where you want to be. It's just, uh, 
Yeah. And the, the, the path is the thing that uh, is the outcome, but at least you end up in the place where you want to be. Steve, one of the things like, sorry to cut you off for a second, because people who are going to be listening to this will probably think, okay, you're asking us to go like have this like slant direction compound on things that you already sort of picked on. <laughs> and that really translates well to something that you said earlier about finding that like founder problem fit, which is find something that you're passionate about and like think about this is the thing that I'm going to work on for the next decade or more. What were the steps that you took to find out your like founder problem fit? I worked on a lot of things uh, and to be honest, not all of them kind of fit this sort of consistency narrative, right? There's a lot of like kind of chill dead ends and retreats and you know, things that I, I tried and realized this wasn't interesting enough to keep going. Um, I mean, this is so much easier to do if you have like the privilege of some free time to do it. Um, and it's like, it's a very hard thing to do like, at work, for example, it's just doing a lot of random stuff and seeing what clicks for you. Um, but it's, uh, I think we'll always, I think the building in public was a big part of that just because it gave me a way of like reflecting on the stuff that I was doing. Um, and if I got bored of the story then I was probably bored of the problem, you know, like, uh, that's all I can, I could just move on. <laughs> um, but then, yeah, um, as long as the, as long as the path backward is consistent, I suppose that's the, uh, that's the story you get to tell. Um, so I don't know, do a lot of random stuff, uh, is the, <laughs> the strategy. Um, yeah, explore and exploit, but like apply to your own interests. Um, since you brought it up, how are you thinking about what's now possible in AI, where this might fit into TL draw and all of your experiments in helping empower builders and creators on the web? Yeah. Uh, it's kind of, kind of two things. I mentioned on a, a sales new project, a Playground AI. That's definitely in my head because I just realized that they are using TealDraw for that. And I was like, oh, that's like hmm. quite adjacent to what we're building. <laughs> I bet we, should, we could do something fun in that space. And I've had some other conversations with kind of founders in, inside of AI that like Canvas is just such a un, unexplored uh, interface paradigm because it's been so hard to build. It, uh, there haven't been a lot of opportunities to like play around on top of all those huge table stakes features that you need to have. Um, so I think my hope is that TealDraw is actually starting to give developers, give product people like the chance to prototype experiments with this type of, uh, like type of thing that's been really, really hard to do, um, uh, at anything more than like a total toy, uh, level in the past. So, uh, I guess some of the things that excite me with regard to, to AI and, and canvas that, um, I don't know, I think like chat, it's like Siri, uh, even Siri, simple as it is relatively, um, you know, it works because I know how to talk to things, I know how to talk to people, I know how to yell at objects, Siri is a little bit of both, uh, and um, like I'm, I'm bringing my own very advanced, uh, communication technology that I've developed as a member of society to the technology. So the interface can be really, um, simple because complexity is in the, the way it's used. Uh, chat is the same way. It's like a good tech for talking to people. Uh, and so it just so happens to also be a good tech for talking to, uh, computers, robots, AIs, agents, whatever. Um. Whiteboards and Canvas, and one of the reasons they're so popular is because they're so good for multi-user experiences, like shared user experiences. You have just enough spatial kind of like awareness of each other without it getting weird in a kind of like VR chat sort of weirdness, um, which is probably too much for most teams, but like the, the 2D Canvas is like a, a good sense of place and presence and movement and like time um, uh, and then direct manipulation so you're kind of yeah it's good it's good for people to people conversation people people kind of collaboration i imagine it's going to be the killer ui also for like more productive uses of um of ai 
or ML. Is that like, you know, if you're on something like mid journey and you're asking for like, give me an image, and then give me another image based on that image and then upscale this image. It's, yeah. it's sort of a, like you could kind of close your eyes and imagine that in a visual sense, kind of treeing out. Um, but the current interface is like a one dimensional chat interface and it, that doesn't work. Well, I mean, it's great. Apparently I think this works very good. Uh, but I think for, for certain like highly productive workflows and stuff, you would want to have a more canvas like, uh, interface. Um, and yeah, if I'm planning a vacation and I want to send a little AI assistant off to, you know, collect a bunch of maps or a bunch of links or something like, uh, I don't know. I think it would be nice if they came back onto my canvas rather than sort of like, um, in, in between my notes or something like that. So I think there's a lot, a lot that can be done in that, um, and that user interface paradigm with AI, uh, just because it's like, if you just replace the, the AI with like a person who is good at stuff, like <laughs> you're good at going and finding restaurant recommendations or something, like I could also collaborate with them on the canvas it would be a good place to do it. Um, and so, yeah, it should work for the, for uh, robots as well. That sounds amazing. Um, I want that. I want an AI that creates a mood board for me or like a math of thoughts. So we're going to close out here with a bit of a speed round. There's no real pressure. You can answer slowly. But three final questions to close us out. Um, the first, now that you're, you've gone from indie designer, developer to fundraising, what's one thing you wish you knew at the beginning of fundraising about how to raise VC? I mean, what, one of the things that I tried to do with with when, when I did my fundraising and, and, and found my, found my partners was find people who had been kind of in the same shoes as me. Um, and I did find a lot of those, those folks, uh, and that there's a lot of like sympathy and empathy for like my position as a founder, or whatever. I think there's a second function for, for fund for investors and stuff is to have someone, uh, who will like kick your butt a little bit. And, uh, and push you forward. I think the, the, the question would be, uh, or the advice to myself before is to like, find at least a few people who, whose salient quality is like, I wouldn't mind having this person like forcefully motivate me. Who's who, who there's a good shoe, butt connection. Uh, I love it. Question two, and you're someone here just crafts these awesome experiences. What are some of the products, tools, companies, brands? that inspire you? There's a kind of a, a class of software that's coming out now, which is addressing problems that have been addressed before, but who are basically just applying like a ton of design on top of these problems. Um, the ones that come to mind, the kind of the obvious ones are like linear, uh, where it's like, yeah, everyone hates Jira. Let's make a Jira that is actually nice to use. Uh, um, the one that's coming to mind is uh, uh, Brian Levin's campsite campsite design, um, where it's fundamentally, it's, it's like a pretty simple app. You're sharing things with your team, like a little Facebook workplace type of app. Um, but every one of those interactions is sort of considered, uh, not only in like how to make it productive, but also how to make it, um, sensitive to the conditions of the team. Things like if I'm sharing my designs, um, do I want people, do I want to know whether people have seen it or not? I might not, you know, like it might be a little sensitive or maybe we should like blur out some of the comments until like everyone's left their feedback so that the first feedback doesn't prejudice the second feedback against, you know, the design and you end up all agreeing with each other. Um, those types of things where it's like, yeah, interactions, even whole sweet, successful parts of software that have been carved out like a successful niche and an expectation of like what they are to return to those and say, okay, like, let's make these 10 times better. Um, I find that really, really interesting and, and inspiring. Maybe trying to do that with whiteboards. Yeah. They're great, but they also kind of suck. So we'll try to make one that's not, not so bad. Um, yeah. <laughs> Raise the bar. Raise the bar. And the third and final question is Erdifa's favorite. Erdifa is an avid reader. Erdifa, do you want to ask? Yeah. Any fun books that you read recently that inspired you or leveled you up? Yeah. Uh, this is going to be a weird one. When I was first getting into like a lot of what I would 
to now is kind of like the visual side of mathematics. Um, and there are things like curves and Bezier curves and you know, some quite advanced uh, math concepts that are just very, very common um, right now. They're like so present that you don't even see them. They're just they're like a Bezier curve. Like, what are, but those were only like invented. Bezier curves were only invented in like the 50s, I think. Like they're very recent. It was, uh, and there was an entire world of, of problem solving around drafting, um, around creating interfaces for machines, and like targeting computers for cannons and ships and stuff uh, that just existed before the computer uh, and before some of these things uh, existed. So um, I have uh, had this, this one of these like uh, books that I had to have printed, you know, out of like a off of like Google Books or something. Uh, this one's uh, Geometrical Drawing and Design from 1913, uh, J. Humphrey Spanton. Um, it's great. It's full of like, here's how to draw these very complex, you know, uh, architectural things that you think like, how would anyone draw that without a computer? Like 3D projections and all that, um, you know, certain curves. And it is the most like jailhouse math you'd ever think like, be like, okay, take a string, you know, and like put some tension on the string and then like draw while pulling up on the string and that will create a perfect arc, you know? And it's just like, what? Like, totally, uh, you know, Roman technology for building, uh, uh, drawings and, and it's incredibly fun. Um, so that would be my, uh, kind of wheelhouse of inspirational literature is the sort of pre-digital, uh, drafting instructions, uh, pre-digital, like, um, how to draw projections and how to, how to render things. Oh, so fun. And you can do it yourself with like a rubber band and a piece of string and the weight. Uh, it's super fun. That's super cool. Going back to the roots there. Steve, it was great jamming with you today. It was truly inspirational to talk to you and can't wait for our listeners to find out more about you. By the way, where can they find out about you? Where can they follow you? How can they stay up to date with what you're doing? So, uh, un unfortunately, I'm still on Twitter. Uh, and that is at uh, Steve Ruiz uh, OK, at G or Steve Ruiz OK. Um, I also have a blog at steveruiz.me and then the big one is teal drop, which is teal draw.com, uh, T L T L D R A W.com. Um, but yeah, find me on Twitter. I, uh, if you search for arrows, word perfect, you probably find me pretty soon. Steve, thanks for joining us. Of course. Thanks for having me. Take care. You too.